On day three of our Road to Chicago series, we're meeting up with some of the Atlantic Council's young Atlanticists in Washington. They all share a common interest in security issues and transatlantic relations. Gerge and Kaylin are both Europeans living in the US. They grew up on both sides of the Atlantic and both represent the special relationship between the US and Europe. Kalin was born in Bulgaria. He says he escaped from communism and lived briefly as a refugee. He lived in many different countries and developed a passion for politics from a young age. You know, transatlantic relations are, you know, are essential to almost who, who I am. Because, you know, growing up on both sides of the Atlantic, you know, trying to communicate to my European friends what the United States is about, trying to communicate uh, to, Amer to my American friends what Europeans are like, has been almost how I have had to grow up and having to communicate sort of different perceptions, also trying to clarify to my European friends what Americans are not like, sort of what stereotypes are false about the United States. Similarly, on the other side of the Atlantic, the same. So that has been sort of how, how I have grown up and, um, and I guess so it's part of who I am. Gergay is Hungarian. He's a young Atlanticist and visiting fellow at Johns Hopkins Center for Transatlantic Relations. His research interests are NATO as well as US foreign and security policy issues. So there's all those commentaries, pundits writing about the demise of NATO, the end of NATO. Well, it still is the event to be, I think. Um, everybody wants to be there, uh, not just uh, young uh, scholars, young uh, professionals like me, but if someone reads uh, international uh, news magazines, all the major actors uh, of in the world will be watching, having their eyes on Chicago at that event. Most of these young Atlanticists are taking part in a youth summit, which is taking place on the sidelines of the official NATO summit in Chicago. We join them today as they prepare for that event by debating NATO interventions, Afghanistan beyond 2014, and their hopes for the summit. The venue of their debate is the Meridian International Center, an international exchange institution that promotes global leadership through the exchange of ideas, people and culture. I don't think any of you could travel outside of Kabul right now without a security escort and feel like you were actually safe because the Taliban controls the entirety of the countryside outside of a few large cities. And so treating the Taliban as if they're not a current active force inside Afghanistan and treating this war as if it hasn't had disastrous consequences in nuclear-armed Pakistan next door it is, to me, a complete illusion of success. You're saying we're not you know, looking at the Taliban as, as an actor. I think that that is why negotiations with the Taliban have been taking place, you know, at first in secret, now a little bit more in public. Okay, yes, it's true that these you know, may have been interrupted for the moment, but I don't think that we're ignoring the Taliban as an actor. And I do think that you know, the long-term you know, peace in Afghanistan will depend on some sort of yeah. arrangement with the Taliban. I think that will be important. So long as the international community does not sort of take its eye off Afghanistan and continues to support progressive forces within Afghanistan, even if it's just economically and financially, I think chances are okay that things will continue in a better direction than they were, let's say, under the Taliban. Also, if I could just add a small point, I do think that certainly the people of Afghanistan have had to pay you know, a heavy price for, for the conflict in the last, uh, in the last decade. But I do also think that their, their daily life is, at least the impression that I have, is, is very different from what it used to be. And you know, I remember thinking at the time, you know, isn't someone going to do something about this? Because this is not the kind of life you want to see anyone living. And I do think that the daily lives of a lot of people in Afghanistan have changed. Yes, it is true, their lives in some respects have become harder in some areas. But I do think that there have been also uh, a number of positive changes, and you can't ignore that. And I come having grown up you know, in, a, in, a, in a communist dictatorship you know, back, you know, back in the 80s. And I understand a little bit about, you know, the kind of life one has under a dictatorship. I think you're right that, you know, the, the daily lives of most Afghans have improved since the overthrow of the Taliban regime. But I guess I would raise the question, and I wonder what people think about this. What do you think the prospects are that the Taliban is going to stay out of power once they're no longer ISAF, NATO, United States forces on the ground after 2014, 2015. I mean, yes, there's a strategic partnership agreement that signals that the international community is not going to simply abandon Afghanistan the way that it did in the late 1980s. But nevertheless, without the foreign military presence playing um, a predominant role in enforcing security, uh, I guess I have my doubts about the sustainability of the, the current political setup. Part of the reason the counterinsurgency did work in Iraq is because it had a functioning state, it had a 
quite big middle class educated people in Afghanistan you have nothing of those about 70-80% of the population is illiterate um, no real modern uh, economy uh, you cannot really no matter how much development aid you uh, you pour into that country in these conditions it would take many 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 decades to to have a sustainable uh, modern uh, economy up and running without uh, continued uh, foreign investment and foreign aid and i think that's an additional point i mean you talked about an illusion of security before but i also uh, think there's an illusion of governance in afghanistan Absolutely. and that will be a big question mark once the funding stops flowing in the in the amounts that it flows now because i think a lot of the local level municipal level leaders have built a sort of uh, I wouldn't call it an illusion, but they've built their legitimacy partly on the fact that they can attract uh, funding from, from the ISAF, from the Americans. And when, when that funding goes down, that will be a, an open question, I think. And there's a lot of focus right now on the security forces, but I think there is a governance equivalent and a development equivalent that is equally threatening and equally concerning. Well, I think one of the things that we could hope would come out of the summit is an agreement among the countries that are contributing troops on coordinating their withdrawals. So we don't have any more of these surprise announcements that all of a sudden, you know, one country is going to accelerate its withdrawal timetable by a year and leaving all of the other partners in the lurch while doing that. I think that feeds the impression that the Western powers are in fact abandoning Afghanistan, that they're rushing for the exits and that we're just completely blithe about what's going to come afterwards. What I would hope for the NATO summit is a sort of a reconnect of strategy with what is happening in Afghanistan, particularly with regard to the political transition in 2014. I think there's a big temptation to say that everything is on track and we are slowly moving towards our goal of 2014 that we're sort of artificially setting in, a, in terms of in, in a disconnect with what is happening on the ground right now and what will be happening in the next three years. I think it's obvious that a political settlement with, uh, with the Taliban will be, will be crucial and I think that it's, it's, um, it's going to be very important to try to re-engage re uh, with the Taliban and what I would like to see uh, at the summit is a, is a very serious discussion about how this can be done, uh, how uh, you know, in this current political situation they can be brought back uh, you know, to the negotiating table because at the end of the day you know, a permanent solution in Afghanistan will very much depend on, 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 uh, on, on the political discussion with, with the Taliban. So what I would like to see is defining a limited scope to help redefine the problem in individual member countries. And I think if the NATO partnership defines the mission as keeping a country viable um, and then coordinating with you know, Pakistan, with other regional partners in helping keep it viable and all we're doing is throwing money at the problem, I think the political ass becomes a lot easier. So what I'd like to see uh, come out of the Chicago NATO summit in terms of Afghanistan is a uh, recognition by the alliance that uh, Afghanistan is a regional problem. It's part of the wider, wider Middle East a regional problem, and it has to be uh, dealt with with it uh, in such a way. Um, a broad strategy has to be uh, outlined, involving not just Afghanistan but also Pakistan, uh, Iran, uh, the other Middle East issues. Uh, you cannot cherry pick just um, conflicts in the region and try to solve it uh, by themselves. I think what I would like to see from the Chicago summit is really taking those lessons seriously and what I mean, and having some kind of answers and a vision again what that really means for uh, for the future. So kind of this post Afghanistan NATO scenario. That's it from Washington. Next, we head north to Pittsburgh, where we'll be talking NATO with high school students as we join them for a history lesson.